Hi, I'm Tandy Trower, Director of the Advanced User Interface Design Group at Microsoft. Today, I'm going to talk about the creation of a well-designed user interface. By user interface, I mean those visual and operational techniques that facilitate the interaction between the human user and a computer software application. There are many aspects and areas of user interface design that we could explore, but for this lecture, I'll focus on a general overview of the basics of design. It's intended for those of you who are designing or developing software applications. At the end, I'll provide a detailed bibliography for those of you who are interested in exploring some other areas of this field. One additional note. While some of the illustrations in this presentation are shown using Microsoft Windows, the information in the recommendations can generally be applied to designing software for other graphical user interfaces as well. In this lecture, we'll cover four major areas. First, a general perspective on user-centered design attitudes. The second will be basic design principles. The third will be a discussion about design process. And finally, a set of more detailed guidelines that can be applied when designing an interface. Let's begin with a few important aspects of human computer or user interface design. One's attitude and understanding can have a significant impact on the quality of a design. Here are some things that are important to remember. First, user interface design is hard work. This means that it takes time, energy, and resources. Often a good user interface requires as much effort as the code used to develop the software. Not making this assumption usually shows through. On the other hand, investing in UI design pays off in great dividends, that is, satisfied users. It's also important to realize that there are no magic formulas, no immutable rules or checklists. While design principles and guidelines are useful in this effort, they're not sufficient. What works in one situation may need to be adapted for another. Often, user interface requires a careful balance between a number of design factors as well as other influences, such as size, performance, or time to market. It's equally important to understand that user interface design is not a fixed process. Instead, it changes and evolves with the industry as a whole. For example, once type-in command line interfaces were considered to be sufficient. In today's more graphically oriented environments, menus and dialogues are more the popular mode. As software and hardware technologies progress, user interface paradigms evolve. Finally, user interface design must be focused on users and their tasks, and not just the afterthought of providing some form of access to technology. And speaking of users, the first step to a user-centered design is understanding how we're wired. Here are seven things to remember about understanding our cognitive processing. First, we as human beings like to feel in control. Nothing is more frustrating to us than to have events occur without us feeling that we have any control of those events. I was reminded of this a couple of years ago while driving on an icy road. I went to apply my brakes and suddenly found myself skidding down the road watching the scenery go by as my truck did a few 360s. If you've ever had this happen to you, then you can imagine the feeling of helplessness and panic that I experienced. Not feeling in control leads to psychological discomfort and stress, and in extreme cases it can even lead to psychological dysfunction. Another important aspect about human behavior is that human beings are better at recognition than at recall. Our memory processes work on associations that we make between objects. We remember some associations better than others. For example, how many of us have had the experience where someone will walk up to us and we can remember several things about that person but for some reason we cannot come up with that person's name. Most memory enhancement techniques involve developing associations between objects. It is believed that these techniques actually develop more and stronger synaptic pathways in our brain. A third important aspect about our cognitive makeup is that we process and retain information better when it is grouped. That is, when information is broken down into smaller units, it's much easier for us to deal with that information. For example, think of the everyday numbers that you can remember. 
your phone number, your social security number. We're able to remember large sequences of numbers like this because the numbers are broken down into smaller segments. But it is not just our memory. Grouping also affects our perception. Try this. Try to visualize a dozen apples. It's easier to do if you do it as groups of three or four. The fourth observation of human behavior is that we learn by doing. By repeating a particular sequence of actions, we embed that information into our cognitive processes and not only retain that information or that process, but may also improve our skill in performing it. Hence the old adage, practice makes perfect. A related aspect is that we learn by relying on our previous experiences or knowledge to learn new things. Every new situation we encounter, every new task we attempt, is affected by our past experiences. We apply what fits and discard what does not. The less familiar a new task is, the harder it is to learn. Often, we learn only as much as we need to accomplish a particular task and sometimes become resistant to learning new things, even if there is benefit in learning those new things. This is why being first to market is often very important. Once users become accustomed or adapt to a particular style of interface, getting them to change can be very difficult, even when there are new or better products. The final thing to remember about human behavior is that we all learn and communicate differently. There's no typical user. Each of us differs in terms of our skill level, interests, and objectives. This is probably one of the greatest challenges facing software designers. But not only do we differ from each other, each of us differs over time, even on the same skills. As we become more familiar with a particular task, we find that we're able to perform it more efficiently. So for any given task, even an individual may differ over time in terms of their skill and proficiency in performing a particular task. But understanding human behavior is not enough to successfully design an interface. It also involves having the right attitudes about design. Will Rogers once said, it's not the things that we don't know that get us into trouble, it's the things that we do know that ain't so. With that in mind, I would like to talk about what I call the seven deadly temptations. Attitudes and actions software designers are tempted by that often have a deadly effect on a product's user interface. The first temptation is designing for the computer or for technology rather than for the user. Those of us who are familiar with computer technology often get very excited about how to use it. We also have a tendency to design software that best fits the code. But most users aren't interested at all in being dazzled by technology. They're interested in getting a job done. They're also not interested in what was easiest for the programmer to do or in the most efficient algorithm to perform a particular function. If we focus on what's easiest for the programmer or more most efficient for the code, then we're sure to miss the objective of designing for the user. The next deadly temptation is designing an interface to be cool or sexy. All of us want to have a positive impact on our users, and aesthetics are very important. However, the aesthetic appeal of an application should never be considered an end in itself. Every element in an interface design should be carefully considered in terms of what value it provides to a user. Design should have a purpose beyond simple decoration. Fancy graphics cannot make up for a poorly designed interface. I'm reminded of a statement made by Norm Cox, the graphic designer for many interfaces, including the Xerox Star. Norm said, you can put lipstick on a bulldog, but you still don't want to kiss it. It's also important to realize that aesthetics are often a very subjective thing. Therefore, decisions on user interface design should not be based solely on whether something is cool. What is cool to one person may not be cool to another and designers and developers of software often have a very different set of preferences than their customers. Designing something to be cool can sometimes have other effects. For example, I remember a particular product team that repeatedly asked their visual designers to come up with some sexy icons. The lead designer decided that she'd had enough of requests like this, so she decided to give the product team just what they asked for, and here you can see the result. Another danger is thinking about design only from a logical point of view. 
That's not too surprising since programming requires us to think very logically. However, in graphically oriented interfaces, visual processing is just as important as logic. Visual processing involves how things appear, how they're grouped, and other aspects of how information is presented. While the internal code of a program requires a very logical process, we must not neglect the visual aspects or the associative ways that things on the screen relate. Similarly, the internal arrangement of code or its order of execution may need to be independent of how the information is presented. Another temptation related to thinking about software as a logical task is to regard user actions as being right or wrong, valid or invalid. While it's true that users do make mistakes, an effective software design should be prepared to deal with any form of input. In other words, when a user makes an invalid input, it should not result in derogatory or condescending messages, nor should it result in the program crashing. Appropriate feedback and messages should be provided to route the user to successfully perform the task. In this way, all user input should be considered as valid and anticipate all combinations of user interaction. The fifth deadly temptation is that of featurism and overextended basics. Now, it may sound as if these are two different temptations, but they're just two sides of the same coin. Featurism is adding features or additional functionality to software that increases its complexity beyond what a user would normally want or need to have. Overextended basics is taking a simple function, and because it's easy to do, adding a number of different variations to that function in a way that the simple operation becomes complex. This is a great temptation in the software industry because software titles are often rated based on their feature set. But in a world of checklists of functionality, it's important to remember that studies have shown that users often use only a small percentage of the features that are in a product. While it's important to provide for a wide range of users, it's also important to realize that every feature one adds one more degree of complexity to a product, one more thing that must be documented, one more thing that must be handled through the support lines. Features or options should only be added when there's a clear benefit for the user, not just because it can be done. The sixth deadly temptation is to assume that problems in the user interface can be fixed in the documentation. While it's very important for a software product to have excellent documentation, relying on the documentation to fix problems in the user interface is a bad idea. Often, documentation is the last place a user will seek an answer out, and at that point, they're usually very frustrated. Ask yourself about the last time you installed a new appliance or piece of electronic equipment, and whether you read the manual from cover to cover before plugging anything in or pressing any buttons. Did you read all the cautions on the front page? Most of us attempt to discover how an operation works by playing around with its interface. Even when we consult documentation, we may not always know what to look for. The seventh and final deadly temptation is to assume that you can fix it in the next release. As I mentioned earlier, we human beings are creatures of habit. We're extremely adaptive, but once we learn a particular way to perform a function, Regardless of how obscure it may be, we often tend to prefer that because it is familiar and what we're used to, even if there is a simpler or corrective means of doing the same thing. This is why bugs often turn into features, functionality that must continue to be supported even though it was never intended, and why first impressions are the most important even when designing software. Now that we've covered some observations about human cognitive processes, and some temptations to avoid, let's look at some of the basic design principles that can be used to address some of these issues. The first basic design principle is user control. But what does designing to allow the user to be in control mean? Well, first, it means that the user interface should be designed so that all actions are initiated by the user. For example, windows and icons don't move around by themselves. Windows don't open and close by themselves. No action proceeds unless the user initiates it. This does not mean that you cannot automate certain tasks in the 
user interface. However, even with automated tasks, is to keep it as interactive as possible, allowing the user all possible options. For example, locking up interaction with an application's interface just because a user selects a particular command should be avoided unless you need to prevent loss of data. There may be other times, though, when modal interaction is appropriate. For example, a drawing program can allow a user to select between different drawing tools. Each of those tools can be considered a mode. Appropriate modes like this are usually visually obvious and easy for the user to switch out of. An example of an inappropriate mode might be something like a spell checker interface that restricts the user's interaction to the spell checking window and not the documents interface. A better approach would be to allow the user to interact either with the spell checking window or the underlying documents window, being able to switch back and forth smoothly. A third way of providing for the principle of user in control is to support personalization, allowing the user to customize aspects of the interface to meet their own operating habits and behavior. This can range from changing colors to redefining or rearranging certain elements on the screen. Next is the principle of directness. Information should always be presented in such a way that users can directly interact with it. One way to do this is by using icons or graphical constructs to represent certain types of information or commands. In defining these, consider the different kinds of metaphors that can be used to portray the concepts that are being exposed. Metaphors help by providing a cognitive bridge between a user's existing knowledge and what they need to learn in a new situation. Metaphors also help leverage user's recognition. However, the use of metaphors should not limit the computer-based implementation. A metaphor's purpose is to introduce the user to a new concept using a familiar one, not necessarily to constrain it to a literal interpretation. For example, while folders in the real world generally only contain documents, there's no reason why a software version of a folder could not contain other kinds of objects as well and could also be used to organize things like printers, calculators, or other folders, unlike its paper-based counterpart. Consistency is the next principle. Consistency allows users to transfer their existing knowledge to new tasks and to learn things more quickly and better focus on their tasks because they need not spend as much time trying to remember the differences in interaction. As a result, consistency provides stability and predictability in the interface. Consistency is important for all aspects, including the names of commands, visual presentation of information, and operational behavior. To design software to be consistent requires considering several aspects. The first is consistency within a product. It's important to present common functions using a common set of commands and interfaces. For example, a copy command should not execute the operation in one situation and in another display a dialog box that requires the user to type in the destination. In addition, functions that operate similarly should use the same command to execute them. In addition, there must be consistency within the operating environment. By maintaining a high level of consistency between the interaction and the interface conventions provided by the operating system, your software can benefit from allowing the user to apply interaction skills that they've already learned. It's also important to maintain consistency with the user's conceptual model and with the metaphors that you are using. If a particular behavior is more characteristic of a different kind of object than the one proposed, users may have difficulty learning to associate that behavior with an object. For example, A wastebasket communicates a very different model than an incinerator does in terms of the recoverability of objects that are placed in it. The next principle is that of simplicity. The popular acronym KISS, standing for Keep It Simple, Stupid, is one way of expressing this principle. But designing for simplicity is not the same as being simplistic. 
Creating a simple user interface may require significant effort. Simple interfaces are often created using natural cues. For example, doorknobs communicate the concept of turning, handles the concept of pulling, and buttons the concept of pressing. Similarly, orienting a set of controls in the same arrangement as what they control may provide a simple way of associating their relationships. However, maximizing functionality and maintaining simplicity often work against each other in the interface. The simplest interface is often limited in the amount of functionality it can support. A doorknob or a light switch are very simple interfaces, but they aren't sufficient for more complex tasks. Therefore, the basic tasks in any piece of software should always be as simple as possible, and more complex tasks should be as simple as they can be, but always implemented without confounding the basic ones. One way to help users manage complexity is through progressive disclosure. Progressive disclosure involves the careful organization of information so that it's only shown at it the appropriate time. By hiding certain information, it reduces the amount of information that a user has to process. For example, the typical drop-down menu displays its choices when a user selects it. It's important to note that progressive disclosure does not imply using non-standard techniques for revealing information, such as requiring a special key to be held to reveal a hidden command. Also avoid forcing users down long sequences of hierarchical interaction. That just makes the interface cumbersome. The next design principle is that of forgiveness. As I explained earlier, most of us learn by doing, by trial and error. And a good interface provides for interactive discovery by warning users about potential situations where they may damage data, or better by making their actions reversible or recoverable. But even with the best designed user interfaces, users make mistakes. A good designer endeavors to understand the potential kinds of errors and makes it easier for users to recover. One way to discover user errors is by doing usability testing, and I'll talk about this more a little later. The next principle is that of feedback. We learn new tasks by establishing the cause and effect relationships between the elements that we interact with. Feedback, or the lack of it, influences whether these cognitive connections are made. Therefore, always provide cues in response to user actions to confirm that the software is responding to a user's input. Even when an application is busy with a particular task, provide the user with information as to the state of the process and allow the user to cancel that process. Nothing is more disconcerting to a user than a dead screen that's unresponsive to their input. The tolerance threshold to an unresponsive interface is only a matter of a few seconds. Feedback may be expressed in visual or auditory cues. The type of feedback you provide should be appropriate to the task. Simple feedback can often be communicated by a change in the pointer's image or with a status bar message. More complex information may require the display of some form of a message window. The final principle we'll cover is that of visual integrity. Visual attributes can provide valuable impressions as well as important cues to the interaction behavior of certain objects. At the same time, it's important to remember that every visual element that appears on the screen potentially competes for the user's attention. The goal should be to provide a pleasing environment that clearly communicates the user's understanding of the information presented. A graphic element needs to function intuitively the way it appears. It needs to look the way it works and work the way it looks. It's a good idea to have a graphic or a visual designer to assist with this aspect of design. Let's move on to design methodology. Creating a well-designed user interface takes more than just following a set of principles or guidelines. It takes a user-centered design methodology that's incorporated early in the product planning and continued throughout the product's development process. One important aspect of design methodology is the composition of the design team. Those that design and build a product can have the largest influence on its success. 
it's best to include a balanced set of disciplines, including development, visual design, writing, and human factors. But rarely are these characteristics found in a single individual. So create a team of individuals who are specialized in these areas. Each will provide an important contribution to the final design. Another major part of a good design methodology is that of the design cycle itself. That is, the steps or processes that are taken to complete the design. A good design cycle includes at least four important phases. The first phase is the design phase. The initial work on a software's design can be the most critical because it's in this phase that you decide the general shape that your product will take. If the foundation is flawed, it's difficult to correct afterwards. This part of the process involves not only defining the objectives and features for your product, but knowing who your users are and what their tasks, intentions, and goals are. It also involves understanding factors like their background, age, gender, expertise, experience level, physical limitations, special needs. Then their work environment, equipment they use, their physical surroundings, and finally, their current task organization the steps required, the dependency between steps, and what activities are redundant. Defining an order entry system has a very different set of users and a very different set of requirements than an information kiosk. At this point in the design process, you also want to define your conceptual framework or the design model that you want to present, leveraging the knowledge and experience of your target audience. It's helpful to brainstorm at this step about the basic organization and the different kinds of metaphors that can be used. As you work through this part of the process, write up your design. Committing your design to a written form not only provides an important reference point, but also helps make the design more concrete and reveal gaps and issues. The next phase in the design cycle is prototyping. This can be done with pencil and paper, storyboards, animation, or even operational software. A prototype serves as a valuable asset in many ways. First, it provides an effective tool for communicating the design. Second, it often helps to define task flow and better visualize the design. It also provides a low-cost vehicle for getting user input on the design. This is particularly useful early in the design process. The type of prototype that you build depends somewhat on your goal. Functionality, task flow, interface operation, and documentation are just some of the different aspects of a product that may need to be considered. For example, pencil and paper models or storyboards may work when you're defining task organization or conceptual ideas. Operational prototypes are usually best at the mechanics of user interaction. Now you can proceed to the testing phase. Usability testing a design or a particular aspect of a design provides very valuable information and is a key part of a product's success. Testing provides you with not only task efficiency and success or failure data, but it also provides you with information about a user's perceptions, their satisfaction, questions, and problems, all which may be just as significant as their ability to complete a particular task. When testing, it's important to use subjects that fit the profile of your target audience. Fellow workers from down the hall may be a quick way to find subjects, but they rarely match the same profile or experience as your customers. There may be other reasons for testing as well. Testing can be used to perform an exploratory investigation that's targeted to discover the potential in a proposed design. Testing can also focus on comparative studies of two, two or more different designs, to determine which is better, given a specific task or set of tasks. The final step in the design cycle is that of iteration. Because it's inevitable that user testing will uncover weaknesses in your design, or at least provide you with additional design information, you want to begin the entire process again, taking what you've learned and refining the design, re-prototyping and retesting. This iterative process should continue through the development process until you're satisfied with the overall result. A few more words about usability assessment. In the early stages of product development, usability investigation can be used to gather information about how users actually do their work. 
and may help identify design opportunities. It also provides valuable input for analyzing initial design concepts. Later, as a product is developed, usability testing can be used to test specific product tasks. It can also be used to analyze an existing product before it's revised into its next release. Usability assessment in the design process can be summarized in a few words, test early and often. A product's success is determined by usability assessment of all of its components. A software's interface is more than just what shows up on the screen or in its documentation. So it's important to consider the user's entire experience as part of a product's usability. Usability assessment can involve a wide range of techniques and investment of resources. It can involve trained specialists working in a soundproof lab with one-way mirrors and sophisticated recording equipment. But even the simplest investment of a conference room or office, tape recorder, stopwatch, and notepad can produce valuable results. Similarly, usability tests do not necessarily need to involve massive numbers of subjects. More typically, quick, iterative tests with small samples, usually 6 to 10 participants, can often identify 80 to 90 percent of most design problems. Like the design process itself, usability testing is best started by defining a target audience and the goals for the test. When designing a test, focus on the tasks rather than features. Even if your goal is to test specific features, remember that your customers will use these features within the context of a particular set of tasks. In addition, run a pilot test to work out the bugs out of the tasks to be tested and to make sure that the task scenarios, prototypes, and test equipment work smoothly. When conducting a usability test, provide an environment that's comparable to the target setting. Usually, a quiet location free from distractions is best. It's important that subjects feel comfortable. It also helps to emphasize to them that it's the software that's being tested, not the user. If they become confused or frustrated, reassure them that this is not a reflection upon them. You may be surprised by the pressure that many test participants feel unless you've been a participant yourself. It's also useful to explain to them the testing process and the equipment that you'll be using. While it's best not to interrupt a participant during a test, there may be times when a user gets stuck or ends up in a situation that requires intervention. This need not necessarily disqualify the data as long as the test coordinator is careful to guide or hint around the problem. In more difficult situations, it may be even be necessary for you to stop the test and make adjustments. However, less intervention usually produces better results. It's a good idea to encourage participants to think aloud as they work so that you can hear the assumptions and inferences they're making. As the participant works along, you should record the time that they take to perform a task as well as any problems they encounter. You may want to follow up the session with a questionnaire that asks the participants to evaluate the product or the feature that they've used. It's always a good idea to record the results of a test using a portable tape recorder or video camera. Even the best observer misses details. Being able to review the data later is invaluable. In addition, recorded data allows for more direct comparisons. It's risky to base conclusions on the observation of a single subject. There are a variety of techniques that can be used to gather usability information. Some of these, like observation of users working at their existing tasks or testing specific tasks, have already been mentioned. Focus groups are very appropriate for generating initial ideas or getting feedback on initial designs. In addition, you can conduct demonstrations or design walkthroughs where the user is taken through a set of sample scenarios and ask about their impressions on the way. In a Wizard of Oz technique, the interaction of the computer's part of the interface is simulated by another person connected to the test participant's machine. These latter techniques can be very valuable, but they often require more training and experience on the part of the test coordinator. Now that we've talked about design attitudes, principles, and process, I'd like to cover some more specific recommendations.
Let's begin where the user begins, with the initiation or execution of a particular software program. When a user invokes your application, it should establish its presence quickly. A user's tolerance for waiting is not very long, so don't depend solely on a wait pointer. Put up the title and frame of the initial window, or some form of a title window as quickly as possible to let the user know that the system is responding to their request. The title of a primary window should always identify what the window is viewing. In addition, if it's possible, restore the window's state such as its size and position when it was last used. This provides stability in the interface. Menus are a frequently used interface convention. There are a number of types of menus. One of the most common types is the use of a menu bar and its drop-down menus. Here, when the user selects a particular menu bar title, the menu associated with it is displayed. Another common type of menu is the pop-up menu. In this case, the menu appears at the pointer on a particular input action, such as clicking with the mouse button. Pop-up menus have the benefit of not taking up any dedicated screen real estate and place the menu close to the user's point of interaction. A cascading or hierarchical menu is a submenu of another menu. When the user selects a particular menu item, the submenu is displayed. An important consideration for using cascading menus is to avoid deep hierarchies. That is, keep the menu level to at most one sublevel. Adding additional levels only makes the interface feel more complex and less interactive. Menus can provide users access to a variety of different actions, from executing commands to setting attributes. A common design error, though, with menus is the use of ellipsis. Ellipsis is that set of three dots that are used after a command name to indicate that the command is incomplete and requires more information. While this additional information is typically input using a secondary window, such as a dialog box, ellipsis should not be considered the visual indication that a secondary window will appear, but only when that secondary window is used to complete the command. For example, for a save command that requires the user supply or confirm a file name, ellipsis is the appropriate choice, since the save command cannot be completed until the file name is supplied by the user. However, when displaying a secondary window such as a toolbox or palette window, ellipsis should not be used. A command such as show toolbox is complete when that window appears, therefore the ellipsis is not appropriate. When designing menus, it's also important to provide users with good feedback about which menu items can be applied. Presenting a user with a message window stating that the command is not currently available after the user has already selected the command is a very poor form of feedback. A better approach is to disable the menu item so that it cannot be selected and rendering it in subdued visual state to indicate that it's unselectable. Alternatively, the menu item can be removed. However, it's generally better to disable a menu item than to remove it because this preserves more stability in the interface. However, if a particular menu command is never applicable in a given context or is not part of the normal working set, it may be best to remove it. A typical software interface design includes more than just the initial window and its set of menus. A set of secondary windows are often used to supplement the interface. These may be used to gather additional data, to provide supplemental controls, or to provide additional information or messages about the context that the user is operating in. Because most windowing environments allow the user to run multiple applications at the same time, it's important that these secondary windows be appropriately labeled. One way of doing this is to use the name of the command that spawns the window in the title text for that window. Another important aspect of designing secondary windows is their layout. In general, the layout should follow the orientation of the way people read the information. In Western countries, where the Roman alphabet is used, this means that fields or controls in the window should be laid out from left to right and top to bottom. The primary field that the user interacts with should always be located as close to the upper, upper left-hand corner as possible. In addition, fields that are closely related should be grouped appropriately within the window using techniques such as spacing or explicit lines that define the particular groups. 
but avoid using a grouping technique around a single field. Since most interfaces provide for a variety of different interactive controls or widgets, it's important to select the most appropriate control that fits the task. For example, a pair of exclusive choice controls are better for providing a field for reflecting a value like gender than a single checkbox or toggle type control. If only a specific set of inputs are valid for a particular value, then consider a control that provides only the valid choices, such as a list box, rather than one that allows the user to enter any arbitrary input, such as a text box. One final recommendation on using secondary windows. Controls in a secondary window can be used to provide access to other or sub-secondary windows. When this is necessary, it's at best to keep the level to at most one level. As with menus, providing multiple hierarchical levels of secondary windows tends to make the interface feel very complex and less interactive. Many applications may also include toolbars or toolboxes, specialized panels of controls. When designing these, it's best to limit their use to common or frequent operations. It's also a good idea to make those toolbars or toolboxes configurable and optional so users can tailor their interaction as best fits their tasks. However, that means that operations that are supported on the toolbar should also be available elsewhere in the interface and that the functions that are on the toolbar are merely a shortcut means of accessing those functions. I mentioned also that a common use of secondary windows is to provide messages or notification information to users. There may be several types of messages that you want to provide to your users, such as indications of status of certain operations or processes, or warnings or cautionary messages, or perhaps to explain the failure of the software to be able to comply with a user's request. For this last usage, it's especially important to define the situation or problem that exists. Suggest alternatives that the user can do to work around the problem. You may want to also provide appropriate alternative choices in the message window itself. It's usually best to make messages as specific as possible to their context, rather than trying to unify too many messages together. What may seem to be a common or related problem in the application's code may not be as apparent in the user interface. Message windows are not the only way to provide information or feedback to a user. The pointer's image can also be changed to indicate certain states or behavior. Similarly, progress indicators such as percentage complete indicators, either as a bar or textual value, can also be used to indicate what part of a process is complete. Status areas are yet another effective way of providing for feedback to the user in terms of communicating context. The final area we'll cover is recommendations related to visual design. How information is organized on the screen can make the difference between a design that communicates and one that leaves the users puzzled or overwhelmed. One of the most valuable yet most abused attributes of a graphic interface is that of the use of color. Color is a very important aesthetic property in the visual interface. Because color has attractive properties, it's often very useful for helping to identify things in the interface which you want to draw the user's attention to, for example, to a selected item. And color also has an associative aspect as well. We often assume that items of the same color are related. Color also carries with it emotional or psychological qualities. For example, many colors are often characterized as being cool or warm. However, when used indiscriminately, color can have a very negative or distracting effect. It can affect not only the user's reaction to your software, but also their productivity, making it difficult for them to focus on their tasks. So here are a few things to remember about using color. While color can be used to show relatedness or grouping, associating a color with a particular meaning is not always obvious or easily learned. Color is also a very subjective property People vary in their color preferences. What's pleasing to one may be distasteful to another. Color affects color. Adjacent background colors can affect the perceived brightness or shade of another color. Interpretation of color can vary by culture. Even within a single culture, a person's association for a given color can differ. 
Finally, it's important to remember that some percentage of the population have color identification problems. For example, about 10% of the adult male population have some form of color confusion. Based on this knowledge about color, here are a few guidelines that you can follow in terms of the use of color. First, in general, use color as an additive, redundant, or enhancing form of information. Avoid relying on color as the only means of expressing a particular value or function. Shape, pattern, location, and textual labels are other ways to distinguish information. A good practice is to design your visuals in black and white first, and then add color. While a human eye can distinguish millions of different colors, using too many colors often results in visual clutter, so use a limited number of colors. Use colors that fit their purpose and effect. Muted, subtle, complementary colors are usually better than bright, highly saturated ones. A neutral color, for example light gray, often works best as a background color. Opposite colors, such as red and green, often make it difficult for the eye to focus. Dark colors tend to recede in the visual space, while light colors come forward. Because color is a subjective personal preference, allow users to change or customize their colors wherever possible. Similar guidelines can also be applied to the use of sound or audio in the interface. For example, when sound is used, it should not be the only means of conveying information, because some users may be hard of hearing or deaf. Others may work in a very noisy environment. Still others may work in a setting that requires that they disable sound or maintain it at a very low volume. When used appropriately, sound can be very effective in terms of communicating information and enhance the interface. However, like color, sound is a very subjective part of the interface and is most effective when used as a redundant or additive form of information. Even when sound is the primary form of information, it may be appropriate to consider using some form of visual representation of the sound, such as captioning or animation, as a user option. Another aspect of visual design is the use of fonts. Fonts may have many functions in addition to providing basic letter forms for reading. Like other visual elements, fonts can be used to organize information or even create a particular mood. By varying the size and weight of a font, we see text as being more or less important and perceive the order in which we should read it. It's important to remember that for many screens, some fonts may be less legible than on a printed page. At low resolutions, avoid italic or serif fonts. It's also best to limit the number of fonts and styles that you use in the software's interface. Using too many fonts usually results in clutter. The final area of visual design is the design of graphics. When designing pictorial representations of objects, whether they're icons or graphical buttons, it's a good idea to begin by defining the graphic element's purpose, as well as where and how it'll be used. User recognition and recollection are two important factors to consider in graphic design. To leverage user recognition, design the graphic to be identifiable by users and easily associated with a particular object. User recognition is best supported by using good metaphors. Use real-world objects to represent abstract ideas so users can draw from their previous learning and experience. To facilitate user recollection, design your graphics to be simple and distinct. Consistency is also important in designing graphic elements. If perspective is used to render an image, use a consistent orientation. In addition, Make sure that the scale of your graphic elements are consistent with the other objects in which it's related and fit well into the environment where it will be used. You may also want to use a technique called anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing involves adding colored pixels to smooth the jagged edges of a graphic. However, avoid using anti-aliasing on the outer edge of a graphic where the contrasting pixels may look jagged or fuzzy on varying backgrounds. Finally, consider the potential cultural impact of your graphics. What may have meaning in one country or culture may not work in another. For example, many symbols for U.S. holidays and seasons are not shared around the world. This concludes our overview of designing an effective user interface. We've covered some basics about human behavior and cognition, about user-centered attitudes and design principles. 
We've also covered design process and methodology, including the phases of a good design cycle and the importance of prototyping and usability testing. Finally, we've covered some very specific guidelines that can be applied when designing an interface, including recommendations on the use of menus, secondary windows, toolbars, messages, and visual design. But this in presentation is only a beginning and is meant to arm you with the fundamentals. There are many more details and aspects to user interface design. A good source of additional information is the bibliography that appears at the end of this video. Thank you, and I wish you success as you design your own user interfaces. Thank you.